And we're handing over to Jason, who's going to talk about the rise and fall of working class power. Thank you. You're I'm not going to stand up for this because I'm going to be here for ages. So, um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to cover the period now between 1945 and 1985. Now, obviously, because of time constraints, there are a lot of disputes that I've not been able to touch upon, and there may be some that we end up doing at a later date. But I'm going to start at the end of the Second World War. So, the British ruling class was in a very weak position at the end of the Second World War. The country was essentially bankrupt. Um, and there was a rise in uh, a collective fervour amongst the working class after the Second World War, and it was brought on by a number of factors. It was a unique set of circumstances. The first one was the obvious one. A lot of people were coming back from serving their country, fighting fascism in the Second World War. There was also a lot of collectivisation at home as well. Uh, there was lots of uh, women working in factories, making munitions and all kinds of other bits and bobs. So there was a, a collective spirit that was developed because those people had to work together to fight fascism. But the other thing that was important to, to bear in mind was that the Soviet Union and the sacrifices that the Soviet Union made to win the Second World War and the fact that it served as an example of how things could be done as opposed to how things are done over here, uh, served to give these uh, the working class people in this country uh, something to aim at and say, look, we need to have something better than what we got at the end of the First World War. Because at the end of the First World War, uh, David Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister at the time, promised the people coming back from uh, the First World War, homes fit for heroes, and all he gave them was poverty and absolute despair. So they were, they were looking for something much better than what their, maybe their, their mums and dads got after the end of, of the First World War. So the working class and the, and the middle class were united in making a series of demands, including things like the welfare, state improved health care and social housing. And so the Labour government of Clement Attlee in 1945 came up with this, this post-war settlement. So... What they did, they nationalised about 20% of the economy <coughs> of this country. Um, founded the NHS, nationalised the railways and done a whole raft of other things as well. Now, the, it should be said, um, given the country was bankrupt, how was that paid for? Well, it was paid for in two ways. One, the working class ended up paying for it. But of course, at the time, the British Empire was still as big as it had ever been. And... The Labour Party used the, Br the British Empire, including India, but um, so 20% of the British economy was na nationalised. There was uh, relatively little resistance to this nationalisation, um, except there were some doctors who were against the establishment of the NHS, uh, and there was some resistance to the nationalisation of steel because steel was was uh, profit making at the time that it was it was nationalised. Now. Trade union membership during this period, from sort of 45 to 51, it, it was growing, but it was only growing pro rata to the growth of the workforce. It wasn't accelerating ahead of it. So all trade unions were able to do were recruit members pro rata to the growth of the workforce. But one, one interesting um, aspect of this growth and with this nationalisation was the rise of what's been called, and not everyone's entirely 100% behind this term, but they called the professional and managerial class. Now, does anyone know what the professional managerial class is? Okay, the professional managerial class is um, a, a class of uh, paid bureaucrats. A lot of them came about because of these nationalised industries. Um, and they were a layer of very well remunerated uh, workers who were not like the petty bourgeoisie, so they weren't small business owners, but they were paid better than regular rank and file workers. Often they came from regular rank and file workers. And uh, the reason why I mention this, this particular group is because the Labour Party, and I think it would be fair to say it started with Neil Kinnock, aimed to get these people as voters at the expense of the working class. And it was the professional and managerial class that were... Uh, instrumental in the defeat of Labour in the 1983 general election. A lot of people will say, well, it was the Falklands War. The, the, uh, the Labour were blown out of the water by the Falklands War. But the truth was, 
What, what did for Labour in 1983 was the establishment of the Social Democratic Party, which was led by the Gang of Four. Mm. And the Gang of Four, I, I always forget, is Bill Rogers, uh, Shirley Williams, Roy Jenkins, and David Owen. They were the four. So four right-wing <laughs> MPs who started their own party and they split the Labour vote straight down the middle in 1983. And, and actually, uh, the Tories polled slightly less than they did in 1979, but, but because of that split, it was enough to see them home with the biggest majority since 1935. There were attempts made by the state at that time to introduce socialistic economic planning and tripartite arrangements. Now, tripartite arrangements are what are, <laughs> what are supposedly uh, equal terms partnerships between the state, the employer and the worker. Um, the, the problem, though, is that with a tripartite arrangement, the tripartite arrangement make, makes an assumption that the state and the employer are separate entities. But the truth is that when the state has to decide between the worker and capital, it will always fall on the side of capital. And that's why these tripartite arrangements were flawed from the very outset. They're, they're things that some, some people on the left and some trade unions still say, oh, it's great, we should go back to tripartite arrangement. But they were always doomed to fail because the state is there to manage the contradictions between the working class and the ruling class. So, um, towards the end of the 1960s, a white paper was published to try and manage some of these, these problems that were occurring with regard to the contradictions between... Uh, the ruling class and the, and the working class. And Barbara Castle came up with a document called In Place of Strife, uh, which was a white paper, never passed into law, but argued for greater social and economic responsibility for trade unions and greater state intervention in industrial relations. And Barbara Castle herself recalled that, I am under no illusions, and this is a quote, I am un under no illusions that I may be committing political suicide. That's what she said about this in place of strife document. Now, it never got passed into law, but it caused an absolute furore at the time. And it, it culminated in the Labour Party being defeated in 1970 and Ted Heath's Tories elected to power. And one of the first things that Ted Heath's government did in 1971 was to introduce the 1971 Industrial Relations Act. And the Industrial Relations Act of 1971 allowed workers to choose not to join a trade union, made collective uh, agreements legally enforceable and restricted legal indemnities and rights on those unions who were registered in inverted commas. And the last, uh, the TUC's, it probably, it'd be fair to say, I don't know whether you agree with me or not on this, uh, Terry, but the TUC's last act of defiance was probably around about then. Yeah. It was the last time it did anything well, good, I think, in yeah. 1971, where they, uh, they ordered the unions to refuse to register held a day of protest in London, and one and a half uh, million members of the Amalgamated Engineers Union went on strike. And of course, around about that time, uh, in 1972, you had the uh, Pentonville Five. Pentonville Five were shop stewards who were imprisoned under the terms of that act in 1972 for defying a court order to stop picking a depot in Stratford in East London. And they were released after six days uh, following a threat of a general strike from the TUC. The government at the time invent invented this role, which was called the Special Solicitor. Special solicitor. They invented a, a role called the Special Solicitor. The Special Solicitor said, no, release these men. Um, and then the Special Solicitor disappeared in a puff of smoke. Forever, forever. In a puff of smoke. So, We'll move on now, we'll move on to 1972, because 1972 was the first of two minor strikes that took, part, uh, took place in this, in this period. So, the 1972 minor strike, uh, miners were striking uh, over wages, a simple wage dispute. And the miners had earned higher than average wages for many years, but found that the wages of other workers had caught up and in some cases had overtaken them because of lower wage rises, especially during the, the late 60s. And around about this period, the NUM used something called flying pickets. Now, flying pickets was a way of deploying uh, picketers to uh, other mines, separate from the one the workers actually used to work at, 
but also, most importantly, they would pick it other workplaces. So they wouldn't just pick it mines, they'd pick it power stations, they would pick it coking works, they would do all kinds of things like that. And simply, they would turn up and talk. They would talk to workers and talk to talk to them about their struggles and they would talk to them about what they were in dispute about. And most crucially, the miners would say to the workers, look, once they get us, don't think they won't come after you afterwards. And they used that, that uh, tactic to best effect. Um, so railway workers refused to transport coal. Power station workers refused to hand out sand. Yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and the whole system of distribution of coal was brought to a, a virtual standstill. But of course it wasn't without cost. And uh, Fred Matthews, Fred Matthews was killed when he was picketing at Keedby Power Station, a lorry driven by a scab driver mounted the pavement where all the pickets were standing and Fred was hit and um, he was killed when he was 37 years old. And there was a huge crowd at his funeral. Um, if you go on Google, you'll be able to find a picture of the funeral. There's 5,000 uh, miners attended uh, Fred's funeral. But the pivotal moment in, in the uh, 72 miners' strike was the Battle of Saltley Gate. Now, Saltley Gate was a coking depot. Um, I won't go into the details of how you make coke because I don't quite understand it myself, but it, it's basically a process of turning uh, coal into a more efficient fuel. And it was crucial for the heavy industries of steel, but also for the production of power because a lot of um, uh, power stations use coal. And Arthur Scargill, who was the president at the time of the Yorkshire NUM, uh, knew that if he hit Saltley Gate, he could cause massive power shortages and huge disruption. So what happened was the chief constable said to the government that Saltley Gate will close over his dead body. That's what he said. And he, he posted 800 police to Saltley Gate coking depot. And with the help of the miners and with the people that they also got around them who were not miners, there was 800 police against 17,000 working class people. And even though it was over his dead body, they had to close <laughs> Saltley Cape Coking Depot. And it caused huge disruption, huge disruption. And it was decisive in, in winning that strike for the miners. Um, in 1974, there was another strike involving the miners. This was caused mainly by inflation. So inflation at the time was running about 16%. And it caused the wages of miners to stagnate uh, because their wages were, were capped by the National Coal Board uh, and the government. Though they lost a vote to strike, um, they withdrew their overtime and that crippled the supply of coal and led to power shortages and then ultimately Ted Heath happened to introduce the three-day week. Now, what Teddy tried to do, in order to try to dissipate the strike, he called an election, which he then lost. So it was a masterstroke on Ted's part, bless him. <laughs> Absolute masterstroke. And, and, and he, he, he basically uh, went to the, the, the electorate with the simple question, who is in charge? And they told him in no uncertain terms, it ain't you, Ted. So that was 1974 and the minor strike. So, so uh, a minority Labour government uh, comes in in 1974 and they introduced something called TULRA which is the Trade Union Labour Relations Act of 1974 which in essence was based on in place of strife uh, and it gave rise to what was called the social contract. Now the social contract uh, which came in in 1975 with the agreement of the TUC uh, encouraged wage restraint amongst workers and their trade unions so it's a maximum of 5%. Now if you look at this rather bonkers graph, you can see here what inflation was like. Inflation there, that's 1975, was 24%. So workers were being asked to take maximum 5% wage rises when inflation was 25%. And in simple terms, that means what costs you a quid at the start of the year is £1.25 at the end of it. So we're talking about ludicrous <coughs> rates of inflation, a lot of it caused by the rise in oil prices that happened around about that that time. So just to give you a, a bit of context as to where inflation was in that period, you, in, in 1976 it stood at 16%, in 77 it was 8, that was a good year, 
78 was 13, and then by 79 it was 18%. So we're talking about absolutely catastrophic inflation, the likes of which we don't see anymore. But the social contract replaced some of the previous income policies as part of the 1971 Act that I spoke about earlier. But there were still issues. Inter-union disputes still persisted, despite the relaxation of the law on merging unions to a ballot of the merging union only. The inflation, as I showed you, went through the roof. And possibly inevitably, I would say, the social contract uh, collapsed because it was acting as a pressure valve. It was actually increasing resentment amongst working people because they saw their prices going up and up and up and their wages were nowhere near keeping up with it. So the whole social contract collapses. The TUC withdraws and calls for the reintroduction of free collective bargaining. The winter of discontent which you may have heard of uh, in the past, the 78, 70, uh, 79, um, where we had the Ford Motor Company strike with 5% ceiling on wage, wage uh, rises. They asked for 17, and they got 17. Um, then there was localised strikes in local government, and uh, there's, there's footage that you can still see on, on, on YouTube and things like that. Piles of rubbish in Leicester Square, because the bin men all went on strike. Uh, then there were reports in the press of the dead going unburied because the grave diggers had gone on strike. There were lorry drivers' strikes. And in, in 1979, there was 29 million working days lost to strike action. Uh, and the previous peak was in 1970, when it was just 7 million days. So you can just see how, how things were in the late 70s. Workers saw the government, the Labour government's anti-worker, anti-socialist and opposed their claims and Labour loses a, a vote of confidence in March 1979 by a single vote which triggered a general election and there was a, a complete loss of the social contract on all sides the workers got fed up with the Labour Party because all they seemed to do was undermine them fragment them and try to defeat them at every turn and so in 1979 Margaret Thatcher's Tories were returned to power any questions so far it's just from my memory. Am I right in thinking that in that winter of discontent there were also power cuts? Yes. Because I think I, I remember those. Yes. Yeah, 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 I, think yeah, I, I think definitely remember that. Price of candles went through the roof. That's it. Right. So, in that, in that period, so from 1970 to 1979, trade union membership rose. It went up from 11 to 13 million. And, and by way of context, I tag on to what uh, Andy said in his, his speech. In 1979, the population of the country was 56 million, and there were 13 million trade union members. And now it's 67 million people in this country, and there's only 6.5 million. So you can just see how far membership, membership sorry, trade unions has declined. So membership density among the workforce during this period rose from 47% to 54%. Female membership of trade unions was 40%, and this professional managerial class membership, which I mentioned earlier, stood at 44%. So membership density remained lower in private sector, and it has always been a problem, I think, that the trade unions have had, is organising in the private sector. Uh, there were some exceptions. Printing was one. Printing was very heavily unionised. Uh, cotton production was, was another. But uh, the, the end of the... Uh, 70s was marked by the sacking of Derek Robinson, also known as Red Robbo. Yeah. Now, Derek was a, a trade unionist, a communist, and the head convener, so basically the lead shop steward at Longbridge Car Plant, not, not far from where we are now. At the time, British Leyland was partially nationalised, um, had a number of car brands, including Austin, Rover, Morris, Jaguar, MG Triumph, and a few others. It was Probably the worst run car firm you could ever think of. It was mired in bureaucracy. It, the, the car builders themselves were building cars despite the technology, not because of the technology that they had available. Chronic underinvestment. Cars were designed by committee. It was an absolute shambles. And I think Derek Robinson always used to go work on the premise, well, you're lucky we built any cars with what factory you're giving us to work in. Um, so uh, he always claimed that the BL workers worked harder than any other car uh, manufacturer because they, there was so much outdated technology, so much bureaucracy, so little investment and so on. 
So the government appointed Sir Michael Edwards as the chair of British Leyland, and following his appointment, 18,000 jobs were lost in 15 months, right. and 50,000 fewer cars were built. So, luckily, Terry brought it with him. Derek put his name to this leaflet, Edward, Edward's Plan and Your Job. So it's uh, a critical but constructively critical plan for what could be done to make BL a bit more efficient uh, and, a, and a bit more profitable, possibly. And for this, he got sacked. He got sacked. Um, they told him to take his name off it, he refused. But then, I think most critically, he was let down by his own union because the Amalgamated Engineers Union um, decided instead of, and I'm sure you've seen footage uh, in the past of all these workers in car parks putting their hands up saying, right, that's it, everyone out. Rather than do that, they decided to run a postal ballot. The postal ballot took a certain amount of time and it was all designed by the AEU to try and take the sting out of it, draw the momentum from it, and by the time that they had sent the ballot back, Derek was gone and that was his lot. Um, and he was, he was a, 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 a victim of what trade unions can do to even the best people sometimes. Um, so we'll move on now. We'll move on now to 1980. So th this is the dawning of what has become known as the neoliberal period. Um, Neoliberalism, um, I've heard described this as a bit like a camel. It's difficult to define but easy to recognise. Um, so it, it's, it's marked by... Uh, effectively a premise that you, you withdraw the state from a lot of decision making and you let the market fill the space behind it. That's essentially what, what it is. And uh, in his speech in 1981, uh, when he became president, Ronald Reagan said, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problems, government is the problem. And uh, in this period of time, unemployment begins to rise deindustrialisation accelerates and the government abandons full employment as a policy. So it starts to use unemployment as a reserve army of labour in order to push down terms, push down conditions and terrify workers. Because all of a sudden, the employer can say, well, if you don't want to do the job, we'll find someone in yeah. hand. There's three million unemployed out there. So the government brought in a number of acts, um, anti-worker acts, uh, the first one was the Employment Act of 1980, which banned secondary picketing uh, and required 80% support of members to keep their closed shop. They then brought in another act in 1982, the Employment Act of 82, which pushed further to destroy the closed shop arrangements and it defined industrial disputes as between, being, being between sorry, employers and workers. So these strikes that used to happen when workers fell out with each other in different unions, that was all banned. And the final thing that they did was to allow employers to sack striking workers without facing an unfair dismissal claim. Now that, that's, that's crucial because that means then that when you go on strike, the employer can, as long as they dismiss everyone that strikes, they can dismiss everyone that strikes and would win an employment tribunal because the, the, the true tribunal sorry, would have to find the dismissal fair. So, the tripartite... Uh, a, a tripartism rather is, is largely dismantled, the clothes shop is gone, we've had the two employment acts. The to uh, Tories have returned to power in 83, as I've already said, because the SDP split the Labour vote straight down the middle. Employment goes up to three million, it's probably more like four, and we get another act of parliament that's anti-work, and this one's the Trade Union Act of 1984. And the Trade Union Act of 1984 sets a legal requirement on trade unions to hold secret ballots, so no car park for show of hands anymore. General secretaries became legally required to face re-election every five years. Before that, they could be elected and stay as long as they liked. And political funds had to be revalidated by a ballot of the members every 10 years. Now, that, that was important because uh, the, the polit political funds, apart from paying uh, labour affiliations, where labour affiliations applied, it, it separated the work that the trade unions do from simple trade union activism and political activism. And if for any reason that political fund was voted down, it meant that all that trade union could then do was act, uh, actively organise its workers and nothing else. It couldn't do anything political because they were not allowed to use their members' money to pay for it. 
So we've got these introduction of secret ballots and so on. Uh, restricting the use of the Chekhov. Now, is anyone, anyone familiar with the Chekhov or what the Chekhov is? The Chekhov is a way of workers paying for their union subs through their wages directly. So no direct debits, no checks, no stamps. It was done straight off your salary. It came off along with your tax and health insurance and everything else. Don't. Just a quick one on that. I always advise my members to pay by direct debit. Right, because... Going on about recruitment, maybe talk about it later. It was a real problem when I first started. It was successful. But what I said to them was, you can join. Join online, pay by direct debit. That way the company don't know how many members we have. Yeah, that's right. And the other thing is, the check-off um, is paid for by the union. The union has to pay a fee to the employer to manage the check-off. So, yeah, it's always best, if possible, to join yeah. by direct debit. Of course, we're talking about the early 80s and things like direct debits didn't exist. Yeah. So by restricting the check-off, you were reducing people to pay branch secretaries in cash and things like that. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk about now a couple of key disputes. Now, as I said at the beginning, there are many disputes that we could have talked about, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on two key disputes. One is an example of how an employer used the anti-trade union legislation to best effect. And the other one, well, it's the minor strike. And you can't talk about industrial action without talking about the minor strike. So we'll, we'll look at uh, a dispute that happened in July of 1983. And it's the, it's, yeah. This is the Stockport Messenger newspaper group. Now, Stockport Messenger newspaper group was owned by a, a tyrant called Eddie Sharp, who, if you're of a certain age, might remember him as the founder of the Today newspaper, which was the first coloured yeah. daily newspaper. He was also a crack union buster. He was, well, it was his hobby, I think. Yeah. I think he enjoyed it. Um, and he, he was used by Fleet Street to <coughs> test if this could be done, to test if he could break the unions in Stockport, because if he could be bro broken in Stockport, then Fleet Street could do it for themselves. So the messenger group broke the closed shop agreement in July 1983. Six National Graphical Association members took action and were sacked for it. Uh, the company used legislation from the 80 and 82 Acts to prevent Secretary Picketing, because they had plants at Bury and Warrington as well, and they prevented boycotts of work and advertising. So NGA responds. This is a, 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 an, an example. This is from the NGA's own uh, publication to their members. Uh, talking about the, the, the battle that's going on against uh, Eddie Shah. Eddie Shah used the, the 80 and 82 Acts, as I said, to, to prevent the secondary pickets. He then set up another print shop in Warrington, employing non-union labour to print a free weekly newspaper. So he went all out to bust the union. Um, they then took out injunctions on the National Graphical Association. The National uh, Graphical Association's assets were sequestrated. Um, but there was also uh, examples of uh, the head office uh, being empty. So the National Graphical Association took out everything. They took the, they took the typewriters and took out everything. Nothing. So they leave the place empty so they couldn't take anything. Um, but, uh, and this is going to be a common theme, the TUC denounced the NGA's actions as unlawful uh, and abandoned them. <coughs> and the NGA relents, ends up having to pay its fines and the dispute ends in complete defeat. And this is, this is an example, as I said, of an employer using anti-trade union laws written for them uh, against their, their own workers. So, we'll go on to the miners' strike, 1984. British mining industry had been in steep decline since the 1960s. Um, a thousand uh, mines were open in the first half of the 20th century. By 1984, there was just 173 left. Uh, the National Coal Board was uh, created in 1947 by the Clement Attlee Labour government. Uh, coal was becoming uh, more expensive sorry, to extract uh, through the old-fashioned deep-level methods. Um, but it has to be said that most coal miners were coal miners because in their towns and their communities, that was the work. That, there was nothing else. It was coal. Um, so there were some key areas of militancy. Uh, one was Scotland, another was Kent, South Wales and Yorkshire. And I think that's a good thing to describe how the NUM was 
the NUN was a, 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 a quite a federal union. So it, it was divided up into regions. The regions had their own executives and they had their own presidents. And as I said earlier on, Arthur Scarby was the former president of the Yorkshire uh, division and then became the general secretary of the entire union in 1981. So, quite regionally fra fractious, uh, and in a way that, that speaks to some of the problems that they encountered later on in the strike, particularly in the Nottingham area. Uh, and part of the problem was, because, because of this slightly federalist um, setup, the National Coal Board were making productivity bonuses for each individual region, so the Nottinghamshire miners got paid more than, say, the Yorkshire miners. Uh, which, which might explain, at least to a degree, why Nottinghamshire miners were so reluctant to, to join the strike when the strike started. So, there's my T-shirt, that's Arthur Scargill, uh, committed militant trade unionist and socialist. So, from the outset, the Tories' intention was absolutely clear. They were going to start a strike with the miners, they were going to break them. And once they broke the miners every other industry would fall into line. So, in 1981, they'd announced that 23 pits would be closed, but they backed down on the threat of action by the miners. But those 23 pits were closed individually over that following three-year period up to 84. The government done a series of steps, or took a series of steps, to prepare for this strike. And the most obvious one that they did was to stockpile coal. So, they stockpiled coal, they began to convert some of their power stations to run on oil and they also uh, proliferated uh, nuclear power as well. So what they wanted was, they didn't want a repeat of 74. They didn't want Ted Heath going on telly telling factories they had to shut down for two days a week extra. Um, because the Tories knew that it was that that overthrew their government and they were not going to allow that to happen again. So they stockpiled coal. They converted power stations and they recruited hauliers to move coal in case the militants in Aslef went on strike in support. Strike action begins in a number of mines that have been targeted for closure, but the, the ballots that put those strikes in place were regional. They were not national. They never did a national ballot of their members for strike. So Scargill declares the NUM, uh, declares NUM support, but opts against the national ballot. The strike starts to spread and flying pickets are sent to mines in Nottingham to prevent scabbing. And in <coughs> June of 84, we had the Battle of Orgreave. And Orgreave was a, a British steel coking plant in Rotherham. The NUM had agreement uh, with uh, limited access. So what they, what they were aware of that was that if you allowed the furnace to go out, it could ruin it. Absolutely ruin the furnace, it would never, never work again. So they allowed limited amounts of coal to go in just to make sure the, surface, uh, the furnace rather was kept running. But then they found out that British Steel were not only bringing in enough coal to keep the furnace running, they were bringing in enough coal to make steel. And so the NUM responded. The police, who didn't want another battle of Salty Gate, uh, where the police were completely outnumbered, deployed 5,000 officers and they deployed them with one simple view. Take on the miners physically take on the miners. So uh, they, uh, they created, or they responded rather to a surge of the pickets by making a mounted police charge. Miners replied by throwing missiles. Police then basically battered them with truncheons and batting. Uh, and if you've ever seen the footage of it, it's an appalling uh, response by the police to what are essentially working class people taking legal action. So, the National Coal Board then begins its legal fight back. It, it, you know, it responds as Eddie Shah responded at Stockport Messenger, and he sues the NUM, claiming that the Yorkshire strike ballot was three years old, which it was. It was three years old. It was from an 81 dispute. So the Yorkshire strike ballot was dated in January 81 and pertained to the threat and closure of the Orgreave mine. But the judge ruled that the Yorkshire strike was unofficial, but didn't rule it as illegal. So he said it's, it's just an unofficial strike. Now that, that, was, that was important because it then tied the union's hands to anyone who scabbed because they couldn't take action against it because it wasn't an NUM organised strike. 
Derbyshire miners argued that they had voted against the strike locally and no national ballot had taken place. So the strike was ruled illegal in Derbyshire. And similarly, the NUM was banned from disciplining those who crossed their picket lines. Uh, the NUM assets were sequestered as a result of court actions and workers' strike benefits start to run out. So they're starting to find themselves in deep poverty, despite the best efforts of the miners, of the miners' wives in particular, and their supporting families. So uh, the union was quite clever, though, to try and avoid as much of the sequestration as possible. They moved a lot of their financial assets abroad. Some people accused them of moving them to Libya. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. <laughs> but the... Uh, uh, the NUM's executive eventually voted to cooperate with the court. And the decline of the strike and the fall of the strike, unsurprisingly, was uh, helped along by the TUC. And Len Murray, the General Secretary of the TUC in May 1984, uh, called the strikes in Yorkshire and Wales unconstitutional and demanded that the NUM leadership call them off. And then when uh, Tony Benn, uh, wanted to put a motion in at the Labour NEC calling for a national demonstration supporting the miners. He has to withdraw it in favour of a vague replacement motion which basically committed the Labour Party to nothing. So the dockers' support for the miners starts to wane. Unregistered dock workers not supporting striking miners. And then the EETPU, a marvellous union, and I am saying that sarcastically, I really don't mean that. They were on for the union, absolutely shocking union, uh, run by uh, Eric Hammond, who was a right-wing racist bastard, yes. Um, so the EETPU uh, vote with an 84% majority to oppose the striking miners. And uh, I'm going to do full disclosure about my union. The TSSA had an emergency motion put forward by the Newcastle branch at their annual conference in 1984, calling for the union to donate £10,000, and someone made an amendment to it, the Nottingham branch made an amendment to it, to change the donation from £10,000 to £10. Uh, the, only, the only fortunate thing is that motion was, was defeated, but it uh, just goes to show you how the trade union movement collapsed around the miners. Neil Kinnock, unsurprisingly, uh, denounces the miners for defending themselves at TUC conference in 1984 and then claimed he was too busy to attend uh, a miners rally taking place in November of that year. The Iron and Steel Trades Confederation, they're called community now, um, assisted uh, non-union labour to unload a ship of imported coal at Hunterston which kept the Ravers Craig Steel plant running for weeks. And the strike officially ends on March the 3rd, 1985, by a vote of NUM National Executive, they voted 98 to 91 in favour of returning to work uh, amidst collapsing support amongst strikers driven to poverty by the loss of wages, union benefits and, crucially, state benefits. The government cut state benefits uh, to strikers and strikers' partners as well. So the, the union made proposals to exchange a return to work for the reinstatement of sacked miners the NCB, the National Coal Board, said a flat no, that wasn't going to happen. And there were still uh, strikes persisting in some areas after the official end in Scotland and Kent, but they petered out not long afterwards. And that brings us to 1985. So there were some key conclusions that came from the miners' strike, and I'll open it up for debate if anyone wants to add anything to what I've got. But I, 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 the, the most obvious one is that the government wanted to completely defeat the miners and destroy the British coal industry. In fact, I would go so far as to say the Tories would rather not one, one piece of coal, one lump of coal come out of the ground if it was a working class person that dug it out. It was as simple as that. A considerable section of the trade union movement abandoned the miners and the Labour, and, uh, Labour Party and the TUC fell, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, on the side of government. And that's it for me. Oh.